So I guess the basic idea is we're all Java programmers here. And as such, we mostly do sort of enterprise server stuff, right? Like cloud computing, backend server, you know, accessing databases, uh, databases and stuff. And we spend so much time focusing on the server stuff that sometimes we sort of lose sight that there's this whole uh, area of programming with desktop, you know, making desktop apps and mobile apps and stuff. And um, it's actually been a few years since I made any of these des desktop and mobile apps. And it, there's a lot of things I didn't, uh, I sort of knew things I had to learn. So I thought I might uh, sort of talk a bit about that. And so the basic idea is what I've been doing the past few years is I've been trying to write an application that runs on a lot of different platforms. So on, on Windows, the Mac, in a browser, um, iPhone, and on Android. And the problem here, of course, is that Java doesn't run on a lot of these platforms. So, but I like using Java, and I don't want to move to something like .NET or Haxi or something like that. So I want to, and uh, so after spending a lot of time looking for, uh, for different approaches, I did find a way where I could write all my code in Java, and I could deploy the Java to a lot of these platforms using JavaScript virtual machines. So during this talk, I'll just give an overview of my experiences about uh, a bunch of the different approaches I tried and sort of what sort of worked for me and sort of what are some of the things that are a bit messy when you do things like that. Um, so during this presentation, I'll first cover why. So I guess it's a bit, this sounds like really odd and a bit of a crazy thing to do, like running your JavaScript on, your Java on JavaScript. So I'll explain a bit about why you'd want to do something like that. I'll then uh, discuss different approaches you can use for getting your Java onto JavaScript and then getting the JavaScript to run on these different platforms. Um, I'll discuss uh, some issues that you might encounter when just making desktop apps uh, because yeah, apparently there's a lot of details involved in making desktop apps I wasn't aware of um, until I actually had to make some. And, and then I'll give a, a bit of a conclusion. So, um, yeah, so why, why would you want to do this Java and JavaScript? Uh, well, as we know, cross-platform development is hard. And one of the reasons is that all the platform makers, they want you to sort of lock you into their ecosystems, like into their walled gardens. So they all sort of try to force you to use a different language for every single platform, right? So on Windows, they really want to try to get you to use C Sharp. On the iPhone, they really try to get you to use Swift. On Android, they're now trying to get used to Kotlin. So, um, yeah, it's just really a pain to like have to learn all these different languages and to write your code multiple times to get things running on all these platforms. Um, and this wouldn't pro be a problem if writing user interfaces weren't so hard. Like I know as, as Java programmers, we like to think, oh, server programming is much harder. It's like the most uh, ideal form of programming. But in fact, uh, user interface programming, I find, is much harder than server programming. Like, if you consider something like a simple button, right? This is like the simplest interactive element you can get. Like you have to consider all sorts of details just to get this button right, right? Like you have to consider like, oh, maybe I want to get icons in there. So you have to write code for that. And you say, oh, I need extra space for internationalization or I might have to change fonts. And you have to deal with whether, um, whether to trigger clicks on like a mouse down or a mouse up and issues like that. And you need keyboard support for accessibility. So you need to be able to tab to your different buttons. And then touch support, of course, because everyone's using cell phones now. And of course, then you have gestures, right? Because some people might not be pressing your button. They might be just scrolling the screen, but they happen to be pressing your button. And there's like simultaneous actions, right? Because some guy might be clicking and touching and like pressing escape on their keyboard. So, and like scripting support. And there's just all these things you have to consider to just get a very simple, uh, like the simplest, simplest user interface element. And this is just for a button. So if you're doing something like a graph or anything more complicated, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and of course, if you do this cross-platform, then you have to learn five different user interface frameworks. And it's just not, you learn the framework and you're good to go because each of these UI frameworks has all these little quirks in them that you have to learn in order to get a, you know, a nice polished user interface. Like sometimes the uh, widgets you create don't have a size until you display them. So you have to add all sorts of delays and things like that. And all these, all these little details you have to work out. And you really don't want to be learning five different frameworks and coding your UI five different times because you'll have all these different bugs and your other different versions and you have to spend like you know, days and days and days learning like the inner details of each framework to figure out how to solve these bugs. So it's really like, yeah, cross this uh, 
the platform makers want you to use their UI frameworks and their languages, but you really don't want to do that. And so Java was supposed to solve all of this, right? The, uh, the claim was, you know, you write Java once and you can run it anywhere. But that's not true anymore, of course, right? Like Java only runs on Windows and Mac. And applets, right, don't exist anymore, so you can't run it in a browser. iPhone won't let you run anything, right, because they're Apple. And you can sort of get, get Java running on Android, but uh, you have to write a new user interface using their activities framework. And even then, I'm not even 100% sure you can just run straight Java code on Android yeah. because uh, yeah. there's some weird lifecycle things there, right? Like, uh, do static variables actually persist, like, between when you switch apps and things like that? It's not, it's not that, like, yeah, it's, like yeah, they're a little bit vague about things like that, right? I mean, they're Android like, Android lifecycle is a talk on itself. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> So that's one of these reasons why, like, yeah, like theoretically it works, but then maybe it doesn't. So then you have to spend all these time, this time learning Android as a separate thing and possibly modifying your code specifically for Android. So, and of course, using user interface stuff in Java in, Java in general is sort of, sort of lagging a bit, right? Like JavaFX is now deprecated, so it's no longer in the JDK. And they made it an open source project, so, and they say it's going to continue existing, but they've, like every other open source project that Oracle has made has, has been sent there to die, so we don't know. Um, and even though, and I guess there's AWT and Swing and stuff like that, but I don't know, there's rumors that they're, they're also going to come under the JDK, but I, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. So it's not clear whether you actually want to spend a lot of time learning uh, more Java UI programming. And on top of that, uh, if you want to actually deploy Java, no one actually does that anymore. So if you're trying to find like uh, things online about like how do I make a uh, deploy my Java application as a desktop app, there's like some pages from the 90s or something. It's like not uh, no one really knows. Like you, it's hard to find documentation or, or blog posts about like how do I do it in a modern system. Uh, so I guess my philosophy when I try to develop my application is. Well, I don't have time to learn multiple user interfaces, uh, inter interface frameworks, and to learn different languages. I don't have time to read my, my code five times for five different platforms. Um, so I noticed that HTML5 is available on all these platforms, right? Like uh, all of these platforms, like Windows and iOS, they have to run web browsers, so they all support HTML5. And it's actually useful to learn HTML5, right? Because I'm not learning like Tickle TK or QT or some other obscure cross-platform framework is, is it's always a little iffy, but HTML5 is actually a useful skill to learn. So you might as well just learn HTML5 really well and use it everywhere for like all your user interfaces for all your platforms. And uh, yeah, some people don't like this. A lot of people uh, complain that HTML5 user interfaces are so sort of janky and inconsistent. Um, especially Mac people for some reason. I don't know why, they always complain. Um, I guess my counter argument is that uh, even on the Mac, the applications are a little bit inconsistent because all the applications sort of came out at a different time. So um, depending on when the app came out, they have slightly different user interfaces. So it's already inconsistent on the Mac. And users are sort of, they do a lot of stuff on the web. So they're sort of comfortable with sort of the small little bit of jankiness and the small inconsistencies that you get with sort of HTML5 uh, user interfaces. So you can sort of get away with it for the most part. Um, so don't get me wrong, there are some people who if they find out your app was written using, using HTML5, they'll immediately stop using it. Like, but if you're like a small developer, this is, this is like, you can't deal with, it's, this is better than having to learn like five different frameworks and writing your code five different times. Uh, it's just, it's just not as smooth as writing sort of a native user interface. Like it's especially on, on the Mac, they do a lot of animations. So on, in HTML5, there'll be like a slight delay when you click, press a button, and then it won't smoothly like slide in as nicely as if you were to write it in like C++. Change, it's, uh, your, your application's taking too long, so the OS will start dropping frames. And that's, and that's what people will produce. Jane, because people will start noticing I'm just in general, it's not, as, it's not as polished as if you were to use the native widgets and the native user interfaces. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't notice it, but then I'm not, I'm not like a designer. I don't really care about how things look. But uh, some people do, and they get really annoyed. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I guess the main question is, does it work, right? So can you actually write a Java program that uses HTML5 as its user interface and deployed across all these platforms? And the answer is, uh, yes, it does. I've been able to write an app and uh, using a single code, place, uh, code base and have it run on a, a lot of different platforms. Uh, the main issue is that it requires sort of a lot of expertise in Java and user interfaces in JavaScript. So uh, if you don't have that expertise, this is sort of a, a difficult path to go down. But hopefully, as more and more people try this sort of approach to making their applications, uh, it will get easier for others as more people post things about it and, and find better frameworks for it. Um, yeah, so now I'll talk about different approaches you can actually use for uh, writing your interface in HTML5 and deploying it. So just, just as a reminder, our goal here is that we want to write all our code in Java. We want our user interface code to be in HTML5, but this HTML5 code will use Java instead of JavaScript, right? So you don't actually have to code anything in JavaScript. It'll be Java, but you're displaying it using HTML5. And then you want to be able to deploy this code uh, to all of the major uh, platforms. So we want to see how to do this. So the first approach I'm going to talk about is using the JavaFX web view. So the, the JavaFX web view is basically um, in Java. So they have the JavaFX UI framework. It actually has a WebKit browser that you can use to display HTML pages. And it, it's like a real browser. It is based on WebKit. And it's especially useful if you have sort of a legacy Swing app or a legacy AWT app or something, and you sort of want to move parts of it into HTML5, because then you can just sort of op uh, have your regular Swing, uh, Swing app and put a sort of browser widget sort of in the middle of your user interface and sort of move your UI elements into HTML5 from Swing like as, as a slow tra transition. And uh, yeah, like it's a, small, a full WebKit browser, but it is missing some modern features like uh, Sound or WebGL or some, like some of the new APIs, like in the internationalization API and stuff like that. Uh, so the nice thing about this, uh, this web view is that it has a Java to JavaScript bridge. So your Java can call into JavaScript and your Javas JavaScript can call into Java. Uh, it's a little bit underdocumented, so um, things like garbage collection, it's not clear if it's actually working properly. I suspect it's not working properly because they never say anything about it. So it would be so much work to get it working properly. They would have mentioned it if they did get it working properly. So I think some, sometimes things might be garbage collected at the wrong times. And um, they also based it on a really old API. Like they based it, I think, on the Java 1.0 API for com like linking JavaScript to Java. So it's sort of not really up to date with the newest ways of using Java. So in particular, um, like in modern JavaScript, you use a lot of binary data and you pass a lot of binary data around, but they don't have ways of efficiently transferring binary data in uh, using their bridge. And they don't have an efficient way of calling functions on their bridge. You have to sort of treat functions as an object and, and call it that way. And uh, yeah, and back in the Java 1.0 days, no one really knew what they were doing. So they have weird things like, um, I guess JavaScript has multiple types of nulls. So they have null and undefined and things like that. And if you return a null from JavaScript to Java, you get a null in Java. But if you return undefined from JavaScript to Java, you get a string that says undefined. So it's like, it's impossible to, to tell whether you actually got a string that says undefined or whether you, it was like a null. And it's just like, yeah, <laughs> but they, they just didn't think through the bridge. They didn't think through the bridge correctly, and they didn't update it for like what we know about JavaScript now. They were just like this is in one JavaScript 1.0 days when they were totally clueless then, right? Like they didn't even think JavaScript would uh, would uh, live on because they thought everyone would move to Java. But anyways, so what I did is if you want to use this for actual Java coding, uh, there is some framework called Elemental that lets you provide it provides sort of a Java. API on top of the standard uh, JavaScript objects. So what I did is I um, 
took that and I made a version that works with JavaFX. Um, wasn't that much work. I made a new version called Dominion Native if you're interested. And basically, you can just use that to sort of manipulate all your JavaScript objects from Java without actually having to uh, do any JavaScript stuff. And uh, you know, it works. You can run things in Java. You can run things in the Java debugger. You don't actually have to do any JavaScript. So just to give you an example, um, here's the code for opening like a browser window in JavaScript. Uh, sorry, in JavaFX. And I guess the whole point of writing your user interface in HTML5 is that you don't have to learn UI frameworks like JavaFX. So I guess I won't really bother explaining it, but the basic idea is you create a web view, stick it in a window, and then you load some web page into it. And then once it's loaded, you can then use these the sort of uh, elemental APIs to sort of manipulate uh, things from Java. So you grab sort of the window object, uh, you get the, your HTML document, you can sort of create a div inside that document. Um, you then reach in and grab that div, and then you can set a click hand handler so that when you click on that div, it'll say clicked. And so this is all Java code. When you run it, it runs as Java code, and, but uh, all, of, all of these method calls will then uh, be bridged into JavaScript, and then the result will be returned into Java. And um, yeah, just some details about the, this JavaFX uh, web view. It's, it is a WebKit browser, like it's based on WebKit, but it's not true WebKit. So they did something weird. So like you get the WebKit and you have the real JavaScript and you have the bridge into Java with it. But for some reason, they decided to run WebKit uh, on top of JavaFX. So it uses a JavaFX backend. And I guess the intention here is so that uh, everything sort of smoothly integrates with Swing and whatever in JavaFX. But uh, I guess the problem is the JavaFX isn't, uh, you're using a different backend from the normal WebKit backend, so it's not tested as well. So if you really push things really hard, you do sometimes get strange errors. And like, I don't know how to debug stuff like that. It's like somewhere in the JavaFX to you know, WebKit bridge or something. Like you don't want to touch it, so you just sort of have to accept them as things that sometimes happen. Um, to be honest, I was pushing it really hard. Like I'd be pushing hundreds of images back and forth between Java and JavaScript and animating them and, and things like that. I think if you have a normal app, this wouldn't be an issue, but um, it is just something I've encountered. Um, yeah, so that's one way you can sort of get Java code running with Java uh, with uh, an HTML5 user, user interface. And I guess the next few approaches involve uh, compiling your Java into JavaScript. And I guess the reason why you'd want to do this, of course, is um, Java only runs on the PC and Mac. So if you want to get your, your code running on other platforms, you somehow need to compile your Java to some other language. And you know, there's options like you know, C Sharp or Haxi or whatever, but uh, JavaScript is available everywhere, so you might as well just compile to that. And um, yeah, so I guess I didn't, this is probably the obvious choice, but then I didn't do it initially. And the reason why I didn't was I thought JavaScript like wouldn't be a viable platform to deploy on. And I guess back then I was thinking like, uh, since there's no types in JavaScript, there's no way you can get good performance on it. And I guess I was building a vector graphics app, so I needed to do a lot of heavy computation. Uh, I was also worried that JavaScript, they have like heavy sandboxes, right? Like no file access, no function calls into the operating system to do things. Um, so I thought I wouldn't be able to do the things I needed to do. Like if you write it in Java, you can always call into Java and use all the you know, plentiful Java libraries to do what you need to do. But in JavaScript, you're sort of locked into the JavaScript sandbox. So I was worried about that. And I was also worried that, um, you know, I just hated the JavaScript APIs. Like a lot of it is very good. So like some of it works really well, but a lot of it are, is just complete garbage. Like the multi-threading is garbage. The font handling is garbage. Uh, you know, they don't really have a proper widget library yet. Like JavaScript in some respects is really, really awful. And there are UI frameworks you can use to sort of get around some of these issues, but they change every year. So it's not clear you really want to adopt them and stuff. So I was really reluctant to go down this path. Uh, but you know you have no choice, right? Because if you want to get things running on uh, the iPhone or something like on the iPhone, you you sort of have to use JavaScript because it's the only garbage collected language that's supported on on the iPhone, I guess. 
So if you do go down that path, you actually find that the performance isn't that bad. Um, I guess all the top Java virtual machine people were hired by Google to work on Chrome's V8. So a lot of the performance things you have in, on Java actually have been ported over to Chrome. And if you're careful with how you use your types, you actually end up, you can sort of work in a sort of semi-type subset because the JavaScript VM, as long as you're consistent with how you use your types, they'll be able to consistently infer the, the types of all your classes and your arrays and stuff. Um, and so you can get, you don't actually lose that much from not having types because they'll be able to correctly infer your types. Um, and it's still not great for heavy computation, like don't get me wrong, like because of the way floating points are represented in JavaScript, if you have to do a lot of floating point computation, it can be very slow. Um, but on the other hand, um, they now have things like WebAssembly, right? So you can, you can always drop down to C++ if you really, really do need to do your heavy computation. And the virtual machines are pretty robust, right? It's uh, not like in the past where the JavaScript VMs were garbage. People are running JavaScripts for servers now, so they actually support like running JavaScript for, you know, with you know decent garbage collection now. Um, yeah. So if you want to run things on a JavaScript VM, you have to use Grit to uh, compile your Java to JavaScript. Uh, no one really uses that tool chain that much anymore. I don't know why. It seems to work okay with for me. Uh, <laughs> Everyone turns and looks at Max. <laughs> Uh, I guess even the first person who comes here regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, the main advantage is you don't have to deal with the JavaScript language, right? Like JavaScript, the language is an awful language to program in. You still have to deal with uh, JavaScript, the API. So you have to deal with all the awful like JavaScript APIs. But as a language, it, uh, you can now just code everything in Java and just transfer things with Grit. Um, I guess the main issues with Grit, though, is it's primarily developed by Google, and Google is not an enterprise company, so they don't, you know, they don't, they don't communicate roadmaps properly. They don't make proper releases. They don't make any documentation. It's like they developed it internally, and they throw it over the wall, and they say like you can use it, but like we don't care if you do or don't. And uh, and people keep coming to you and saying it's dead, and you're like, no, I use it. It's fine. It works great. But you know, they don't care and things like that. Um, yeah, the documentation is really out of date. Like, to show you how out of date it is, like the website doesn't even work, doesn't have touch support, so you can't even use it on a cell phone or a tablet or anything. It's like, it has menus that trigger on mouse over, so you can't even use the website. It's like, things are, things are pretty old there. But if you can actually get it to work, it works pretty well. And, uh, and they, it's, for the most part, it's up to date, right? So it supports JDK 11 and things like that. So. Um, it's maintained, but they don't, they don't communicate the fact that it's maintained. And you sort of have to dig through a lot of old documentation to figure out how things work. And, uh, and of course, yeah. So once you use Grit to compile things into JavaScript, uh, you end up joining the JavaScript ecosystem. And I guess the way I sort of, it took a while to get me accustomed to how things work in the JavaScript ecosystem. And I guess I liken it to like the Stack Overflow programming ecosystems. And what I mean by that is uh, there's a lot of programmers who don't really care to understand how things work. All they want is a tool that does everything for them. Like I, like, I don't care how to do it. Just give me a command that I can run, and that would do it for me. And um, so basically what happens is like you, know, you need to do something, and you'll look up, OK, how do I do it in JavaScript? And instead of saying, like, this is what you have to do, and like this is and explaining why it works, they just say, Oh, here's some open source code, or here's some open source tool. Just run it, and it'll solve your problems. And if it does work, it's fine. But if it doesn't work, then like they say, yeah, why? Well, I don't understand. They say, well, it's open source. Just go into the code and fix it yourself. And so it's a bit annoying that way. Um, there's also no enterprise backing, so it's just like with Grit. There's a lot of companies that have developed their own JavaScript things, and they just open source it, like, and they say. You can use it, but they don't actually back it with like proper documentation or proper releases or like proper roadmaps or anything like that. And yeah, and you're crowdsourcing your tooling essentially, right? Because because it's stuff that various random companies have open sourced. You just have to use like random code from random companies, right? There's no 
like, oh, IBM has made these sets of tools that work well together, use them, or Oracle is, has made these things, like, use them, and they work well. It's just like, oh, I'll just grab thing, random things from GitHub and use it. And you have no idea whether this stuff is good or, or sucks or just whether it's popular or not. And that doesn't necessarily reflect the quality of the code. Um, yeah, so <laughs> in fact, it's more popular in the past, yeah, but it's, so yeah, so once you're in JavaScript, there's all these frameworks you can use for actually getting the JavaScript to run on different platforms. So I guess I'll talk about the first one, which is Cordova. And I guess Cordova is this framework which you can use for getting your JavaScript code to run on mobile platforms. And so it's an Apache project. I guess it was previously called PhoneGap. And I guess it's especially useful in the iPhone because uh, yeah, like I said, there's no garbage collected languages for the iPhone except for JavaScript. So if you want to you know, have the advantages of a garbage collected language, you're going to have to use JavaScript and Cordova deploys to that. And I think Cordova is an Adobe project. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, I'm not sure if that's a problem or not. They aren't really known for their great enterprise software development, but uh, you know, they have made Adobe Flex and other enterprise software, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically, Cordova is pretty easy to use. You uh, you basically just uh, you create a, uh, a directory, you make a configuration file, you make another directory, you dump your web pages there, and that's it. You then run some magic Cordova command, and it outputs like an Android binary, and then you're like, ah, oh, done. That, that's all you have to do. Um, I guess the weird thing with using Cordova is, so it's based on, I think it's based on the Node.js ecosystem and it's sort of built as like a modular build system. So you think, oh, it's like a, so all the functionality for actually getting things to run on Android or iOS or whatever, those are actually plugins to Cordova. So the raw Cordova itself is more like make, like for running make files. And then they have plugins for actually getting it to run on, on, on different mobile platforms. And then if you need any extra features or anything thing like that, they also have other plugins that you then plug into Cordova. But like Cordova itself is just like a build system. So it doesn't actually do anything. And um, once you start getting, getting to use Cordova, you find like getting started is pretty easy, right? The, uh, the, doc, the getting started documentation is fine. But then once you have to do anything else, it quickly gets really messy. So, um, I guess the example I use, I guess, is in Android. Uh, you need to have like 10 different icons for your app, right, to get things into the App Store because every cell phone has diff a different resolution, so you need to uh, supply icons at different resolutions to get it uh, for all these different uh, cell phones. And so you, you want to see, if you make a Cordova app, you might want to go, okay, so how do I get these 10 icons into my app? So then you would uh, sort of look in the Cordova documentation and you'd see there's no information about that. And that's because Cordova doesn't actually do anything, right? It's just a build system. So then you have to look in the plugin, the Android plugin for Cordova, on how you make your, your icons. And you might find a little bit of information there, but it won't give you the complete information, right? Uh, so then you have to look in the Android documentation. And then the Android documentation will have like pages and pages of stuff about the icon, but still not very clear, but at least they have some information there. And they'll say like, oh, to get things work on Android, you have to put you know, your files here and here in the build system and whatnot. But uh, that's not the information you need for, Cordo for Cordova, right? Because you need to put the files in a certain place in Cordova to get it in the right place in Android. So then you have to go back into the Cordova documentation and then figure out like, uh, where do I have to put things in Cordova to get it in the right place in Android so that in the Android build files, so then it compiles and gets into Android, right? So, by the time you've done all that, and like you're, you're trying to translate the Android documentation so that it fits with Cordova and all these back and forth, um, it's not clear whether you've actually saved any time uh, by using Cordova, right? Because you ended up learning Android anyways, and then you had to waste all this extra time translating your Android knowledge into Cordova knowledge, which has less documentation and things like that. So it's not clear you save any time by doing that. Um, and like I said, Cordova doesn't do that much. So if you want to have any extra functionality, functionality like opening files or you know having in-app purchases or anything like that or having a splash screen uh, you have to do that using plugins and um, it's just like the node.js ecosystem right it's all this random code on github like all these plugins on github 
Uh, there's like 10 different plugins for anything you want to do and you don't know which one to use. And some of the code is garbage and some of it is unsupported. Some of them, like it says the license is one thing, but when you go in the code, the license is actually something else. Uh, and they made it a commercial thing and like who knows, right? Or maybe it's malware now. So, and they're all written by JS programmers who were too lazy to actually learn real code, like actually learn how to write the uh, mobile things. Like I know we are too, but then like, I don't know, like I don't, you don't really want to trust the code that much. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, not, not, not that great. And another, another issue is um, all of the code is, all of the code to use the plugins are, is asynchronous. And asynchronous code is fine for server programming, but it's like horrible for user interface programming. Like, I don't know why they kept keep pushing asynchronous code for JavaScript because for user interface programming, uh, it just makes it impossible to reason about the correctness of your user interface code uh, if things are happening asynchronously. So it's just, uh, it's just a real pain to use any of these plugins uh, from JavaScript. So yeah, that's the issue with uh, Cordova. I guess the next, uh, the next thing I'll talk about is uh, Electron and Node WebKit. So I guess the uh, Electron and Node WebKit are the uh, JavaScript frameworks you can use for getting your JavaScript code working on desktop platforms. And the idea behind these uh, these frameworks is, I guess, Node.js. Uh, what they did is they took uh, Chrome and they removed Blink, right? They moved the web rendering engine. So you get the, a JavaScript server, right? JavaScript that you can run on the server. And what uh, Electron and Node WebKit did is they took Node.js and they added Blink back in so that you get Chrome again. So it's sort of like a circular way to get back to the beginning. Um, Electron is used by uh, Visual Studio Code, Atom, and Slack and stuff. So it has a lot of traction, uh, NDWJS. It's still used by a lot of people, but uh, I don't think there's any big names in it. Um, so, yeah, so I guess the advantage of, of this over using Java is you actually have a real, a real uh, web browser, not this fake WebKit one from JavaFX. And, um, you know, you have control over your web, your web which, your web engine, and from that web engine, you can actually call into C++ code. So you have synchronous access uh, to C++ code and full access to the underlying data structures. So you can transfer a lot, a lot of data back and forth between uh, the operating system and, and your JavaScript. So I guess uh, Node WebKit, I guess, they, I think it's backed by Intel, and they hired a lot of sort of enterprise quality devs to work on it. And it's sort of reflected in the, vac in the fact that the documentation is very clear and like really easy to work with. Like it's almost a joy reading uh, the Node WebKit documentation. Uh, by contrast, uh, uh, Electron is made by GitHub. So I guess that's Microsoft now. And uh, the documentation often is like, a, it's just a list of method names, right? Like they'll say like, oh, you can, to use the clipboard, we have an object for that. Here's the methods you can call. And then it's like, that's all their documentation is. Uh, and it's, it's part of this, like they were developing Electron so they could make their Atom thing or whatever, and they don't really care to support it like an enterprise company does. So they just like, here it is, like have fun. Um, yeah. So of the two, I guess uh, Node WebKit is a lot easier to use. You like just download it, you stick your HTML files, file, HTML files somewhere and start it up and everything sort of works. And um, it only provides some limited functionality beyond sort of a standard web browser. But what they do provide is pretty well explained and it has well thought out defaults and stuff. So it's, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, by contrast, Electron is sort of a big pain to use. Um, you can't just stick your file somewhere. You have to write a separate JavaScript loader program that will get loaded on startup and then you have to create a window from this JavaScript program to then load your HTML files. And um, one advantage of Electron, though, is that they do have a lot of libraries built in for doing desktop integration stuff, so notifications or, yeah, I don't know, uh, having, uh, setting your icons and things like that. Um, one problem, though, is Electron, they sort of have this weird multi-process architecture. So some of the libraries can only be called from certain processes. So you have to, sometimes to do things, you have to call into a separate process to then, you know, 
do the native uh, OS work you need to do and then trans transfer the information back to your process. So it's a bit of a pain to use sometimes. And even then, some stuff that you expect to work don't work. So things like uh, file dialogs are actually a standard part of HTML5. So um, you should be able to just use them, but for some reason they don't work in Electron. So you have to use the Electron libraries for doing file dialogs and things like that. And, uh, and another thing with Electron is they really, dump, they really jump down the Node.js rabbit hole. Um, so as, as, an, as an example of that, uh, if you go to the Electron website, you can't, there's no link for actually downloading Electron. Um, like if you go to the GitHub and dig around, you can find ways to download Electron. Uh, but on the website, there's no download link. And there, instead, they have instructions for creating a Node.js project. And in this project, you can create a dependency on Electron. And then when you compile the project, it'll then download Electron into your project or something. It's like, like or you could just make a zip file that I could download or something like Node WebKit does. But they really like this Node.js stuff. So like, uh, so if you want to go down that rabbit hole too, you can Electron's the route to go. Um, and I guess the, uh, I guess finally I'll talk about making a custom web view. So I guess the idea here is, um, I guess there's web browsers already on all these platforms. So instead of sort of packaging your own web browser, or instead of uh, using Cordova or something like that, um, you can just uh, write your own native code to open up a web browser and load your code into it, right? And I guess the idea is um, on the desktop, on the desktop, right on PC and Mac, you don't really want to have to push around Electron because it's, it's pretty big pushing a browser around. So you can have smaller apps if you just use uh, whatever browser is already on, the, on Windows or Mac. And then on iOS and Android, I, like I said, Cordova is sort of a pain to use. So why don't you just write your own code instead of using Cordova? Um, like in the past, Cordova was useful because it was actually really painful to start up a web browser on the Mac. but. Uh, Sorry, on the iPhone, but that's no, no longer the case. So you can actually write your own code to do this. Um, so I guess on Windows, you can use uh, UWP for, for their what universal Windows platform program. I guess they're the new APIs for using Windows. And I guess if you use UWP, they actually treat JavaScript as a first class language. So I guess if you're programming UWP, you can use C++, C Sharp, or JavaScript. So it's one of the main supported languages. Um, there's, it mostly works. Like some things are a little bit broken, like uh, it's sandboxed improperly. So you can't really access files that you need easily. So some things don't quite work. So you, you can work around it though. So I, I think it, it's possible to do things. And um, it has a pretty good bridge with C Sharp. So from JavaScript, you can call into C Sharp and back and forth and pass data, data back and forth pretty easily. So you would think, oh, this UWP thing would be a good route to go. Um, I guess when I used it, I found it, it wasn't that nice. And I guess the main problem is you can't actually make Windows programs with it, right? Um, like the standard Windows programs you get on the desktop, you know, with your menu, menu bar and good desktop integration, right, where you can drag files into it and things like that. You can't actually make that with UWP. Um, and on top of that, uh, I guess UWP has its roots as a cell phone API. So it's just a real pain to code it if you want to code a desktop app with it. So I guess uh, one example is, uh, let's say in a desktop app, uh, you have virtual memory, right? So you use as much memory as you want. And if you switch to another program, the operating system will automatically save you to disk if like, no one's using your program, right? And you don't have to deal with it. Uh, but with UWP, it's based on a cell phone API, so they have all these lifecycle things. So every time you switch, every time your app loses focus, uh, the operating system can then kill your app in order to save memory, right? Like, uh, just like uh, on the iPhone or Android. So that means every time you lose focus, so every time you switch windows, your app is supposed to save its state so that if it gains, uh, so then the operating system can kill you at any time. And then when you gain focus again, you're supposed to restore yourself from that state. So if you're making something like a compiler or whatever, that means if you lose focus or you're running the compiler in the background, you have to be able to save everything so that the operating system can kill you. And um, there's other issues with files, right? It's all sandbox, so you can't actually open files, sort of like on Android or the iPhone, right? Um, 
And if you get like, if they switch windows, you lose permissions to all those files. So you have to then, they have this new API that lets you save your permissions so that when your app gets restarted, you can get those permissions to the files that you had open. You know, it's just a big mess, right? And there's none of this, when you close your application, you can't say like, do you want to save your file? Like, you can't say that because uh, when you lose focus, they can, you can be killed at any time. It's, it's like, it's, it's just a whole nightmare to work with, right? And you can't get multiple windows going because each window is a separate process. But then when you lose focus, only one process is supposed to save the state of the other windows. So you have to like send all your state to one window to then save it. it it's like, you don't really want to code anything in UWP. So yeah, don't. Um, and on top of that, UWP keeps changing. So they they realize this garbage. So they keep like adding new features into it so that you can do more things with it. So you keep having to change, see the documentation. And, uh, and of course now they've, they've just gotten rid of their browser. So it's, it's not even clear like what you're supposed to do here, right? Like things are changing, right? Edge is gone. Um, I don't even know what they're going to do with the JavaScript stuff now. Um, on the Mac OS, I guess, and on iOS, they have the WK WebView. So this is sort of the main, uh, I guess it's the WebKit WebView. So it, you can, since Safari already exists on, on the Mac and the iPhone, you can just sort of pop up Safari as a widget in any window you want. And, uh, you know, it's okay. Safari is pretty fast. Um, a few things are broken in it, and Apple, because they don't care about the web, they never bother fixing it. Like just to give you an idea of how broken is broken it is, when they first made the WK Web View, you couldn't actually open any local files from it. Uh, so, like if you had your own like web page and you wanted to open it in WK Web View, um, you couldn't open it. You could only open things that were on the internet. And then they didn't really bother fixing it for a while um, because they don't really care. And they did fix it in the end, but there's other things that are broken and like Apple doesn't care uh, because it works for iTunes or whatever. And like you can work around it, but it's like, um, yeah, it works enough that you can work around any issues you do find. But uh, yeah, th that's all you can say. It works. Um, everything for calling between JavaScript and native code is asynchronous. So that means you have to make all these asynchronous APIs for everything. Uh, from JavaScript, so it's a bit of a pain to use. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it works. Uh, Android also has a web view. Uh, it also works okay. It's also some, part, some parts are synchronous, but some parts have to be asynchronous as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it works. It's a bit annoying transferring large amounts of data between JavaScript and uh, your Java code, but it works fine. Uh, so I guess that's it. And I guess I'll, I'll discuss a bit about deploying desktop apps just uh, because there are some issues, interesting things there. Uh, so I guess if you're deploying things uh, using Java, um, so if you wanted this to use this JavaFX thing in the JavaFX web view, um, you end up with a binary that, um, a deployment that's about 110 megabytes. Uh, so 30 megabytes of that is the WebKit and about 10 to 20 megabytes of that is JavaFX and the rest, rest is the Java virtual machine. Uh, but it compresses down to around 50 megabytes, so it's not too bad. Um, so when I was doing, trying to deploy things this way, I guess there weren't any uh, pre-built versions of OpenJDK 8 available. So I had to build that myself and deploy, uh, build JavaFX myself and build WebKit myself, which was sort of annoying. And then afterwards, you sort of have to dig into the class files to remove stuff you didn't need to get things smaller. Uh, but I think now uh, you can get you can go to go to adopt open JDK to get your JDKs, and uh, with modules you can just use Java Packager to remove things you don't need, so you don't have to manually go in and remove things from the class files. And then you can use uh, this open source project Launch4j to then uh, make an executable binary that will start up the J, uh, your JVM and your and your code. So deploying things with Java, that's how you do it. Uh, if you want to deploy things using Electron or Node WebKit, um, I guess a deployment with Electron or something like that comes around comes out to around 80 to 90 megabytes, uh, but it compresses to around 40. And um, I guess you need to rebrand it because uh, the binary is called will be called like Electron. And when you run it, it'll say Electron on the bottom, 
and the task manager, they'll say Electron. So there's some rebranding step you need to actually change, change it to say like the name of your app. And uh, yeah, like I said, there's all these weird uh, sort of GitHub tools that will do this packaging for you, but they don't really explain what they're doing. They just sort of like output an installer and they say like, that's it. And uh, yeah, it's sort of annoying that way, but that's what's involved. Um, and then once you have your Java or JavaScript VMs, uh, it's actually pretty easy in terms of deployment because it's all self-contained. So there's no, uh, you basically just un, you know, put your code in a directory somewhere and then they can run it. You don't have to register any DLLs or anything like that. Um, so you think, okay, all you have to do then is distribute some zip files or something like that. Um, it turns out people don't know how to use zip files. Like if you give them a zip file, they'll double click the zip file to go into it and then they'll double click the binary and then they'll wonder why it doesn't work. Um, so you actually need to give them installers apparently. Uh, and then, yeah, but making installers, actually there's a cost involved. Like you would think, oh, you know, I, I can make an executable file. I just give that to people. But apparently you do need to pay like yearly fees and get all these accounts and stuff like that. Uh, so for example, on Windows, uh, to make an installer, like you can make an installer with Visual Studio, but uh, uh, if you're like making an Electron or Java thing, it's not really clear how to make things and install in Visual Studio for that. So instead they have this open source tool called Wix for making MSI installers from like just a bunch of files. And uh, so Wix is basically just an XML file, but learning how to build this, make this XML file is like really, really hard for some reason. Like it took me one or two weeks to figure out like how to make an installer that just unzips things to a directory and makes a shortcut or something like that. Um, and I think it's purposely made this complicated because they, uh, they, they get a lot of, uh, they make their money from consulting on how to use Wix uh, to build installers. So I think they purposely make it complicated so that even if you have something simple, you can't like, it'll take you weeks to figure out how to use the tool, but um, you can figure it out if you need to make an installer with this tool. And then once you have the installer, you have to sign it, which is like something I, I wasn't really familiar with at the time. And uh, you really do have to si sign it because uh, although like we may have downloaded things in the past and double click it and get that warning and, and skip it, um, if you're like a not a known company, a, a browser won't even download your installer, right? If they download an installer and it's not signed and you're some small company that no one has downloaded stuff from before, uh, it'll just, uh, Chrome will just erase your file. Um, and not let users run it. So you do need to sign it. Uh, so to sign it, you need to buy a code signing certificate. And to get the code signing certificate, you know, you have to go to two cows or something and spend $100 per year to get the certificate. And um, in order to verify your identity, you need, might need to pay someone else to verify your identity. So you might need, need a yellow pages listing or something, which will also cost you $100 a year, a year or something like that. And um, I don't think people really make that Windows applications that much anymore. So um, it's really like, if you look at the web pages for getting the code signing certificate and how to use it, like they're all stuff from the like 90s and early 2000s and stuff. And like just getting the code signing certificate, it's like you have to get out your copy of Internet Explorer. And like they use parts of Internet Explorer that you've never, like it's stuff you've never even thought were in web, web browsers. Like apparently they have a whole like certificate signing part of web browsers that I, I didn't know about. And that, but like, yeah, it works, but like, it's just stuff that you, you've never seen before. And the documentation is very old, like it's GeoCities pages and stuff like that. Uh, by contrast, getting stuff into the Windows Store is pretty easy and it's pretty cheap. There's just a one-time fee to Microsoft because no one cares about antitrust issues anymore. Um, you just dump everything in a directory. You say, I can, you make a configuration file that says all my code is in this directory. You run a command line tool and outputs a, uh, some, some installer thing, and then you, uh, you just upload that to Microsoft and they'll sign it and put it in the Windows Store. So it's, uh, that's, it's a cheaper and easier route, I guess. Uh, Mac apps, I guess uh, you don't have installers because everything's packaged up nice uh, as a single binary, I guess. During development, it's a bit of a pain because the Mac sort of automatically installs things. So you might have multiple versions of the same app, like your development version and one you installed from the store. And it's not clear which version is running because the Mac just automatically chooses stuff. And you don't know if it made the right decision, but, um, and you also have to sign stuff. Um, 
and Apple supplies you the keys. So because again, they this is post uh, post Windows or whatever. So yeah, and mobile stuff, I yeah, I just didn't really deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I said, I, I use the custom web views in the end, and Cordova has like things for signing things, right? So you just upload things into their app store, and, and that's it, right? Like, uh, there's as long as you stay within their walled garden, it's it's pretty easy, and I didn't try to do anything weird. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, there's there's documentation, right? And uh, modern documentation, right? And there's a lot of people doing it. So, um, right. So, right. In conclusion. So this is sort of what I ended up doing in the end. Uh, on the Windows, I use Electron. Uh, on the Mac, I use sort of my own code for running, uh, for, for bringing up Safari and running my app. Um, oh, in all cases, I take my Java code and compile it to JavaScript. So that JavaScript code can run in a web browser. I don't have an iOS version yet. And on Android, I also use my own code for, for starting a web view. Um, so I guess of all the approaches, each one has different advantages and disadvantages, right? Like with JavaFX, you can run things, everything in Java, which is really nice. Um, I guess with Electron, it's easy to transfer large amounts of data between your JavaScript and native code, which is also nice. And uh, you, you know, with Cordova and writing your own, own custom code, you get small binaries and you get up-to-date browsers and things like that. Um, ideally, like someone will build the ultimate system where like you could get an HTML5 UI that runs, you know, runs with Java or without Java, um, or you could get your Java to compile to Objective C or something, and that lets you synchronously transfer large amounts of data between uh, the web browser and your operating system and things like that. Um, I guess the issue here is, I guess there's not many companies that could actually build something like that, so I don't think there's enough demand for it. Like basically, it would be. IBM or Oracle who have the Java and JavaScript and virtual ma machine experience to do something like that. And I don't think there's enough demand to, to actually build something like that. But uh, yeah, ideally, I think something like this could be built, but uh, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, Java and JavaScript virtual machines, this is a viable way to sort of make your apps. Um, I was able to write an app with shared UI code for everything. Um, one code base for Windows, Mac, web uh, and Android. And um, you, know, you have to dive into the JavaScript ecosystem and it's not very clean or very well engineered, but it's very vibrant, which is nice, right? You, there's a lot of people blogging about it. Uh, there's a lot of sort of well-worn paths that you can follow uh, to figure out how to do things. And um, yeah, just as a general thing, like we're Java programmers, so we do a lot of server stuff and it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there's this whole sort of area of, you know, client-side programming and mobile and desktop apps. So it's interesting sometimes just to dive in there and see um, you know, what, what, how to do things there. So that's it. <laughs> so any, uh, any questions? <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, WebKit and like a Java WebKit. yeah. Uh, so no, because like if you talk to the JavaFX people about their their web browser, they're sort of they put it there reluctantly because they actually want you to use JavaFX. So they don't like if you push them on it, they're like, why aren't you just coding it in JavaFX? Or like we have the you know we have three D frameworks in JavaFX. Like why don't you use that? So they don't really like it, and I think the team is mostly gone anyways. So um, yeah, no. Uh, Find any alternatives to uh, GWT for compiling Java to JavaScript? Uh, there are other alternatives, uh, but it seemed like they didn't, they weren't as knowledgeable about compilers as the GWT people. So it seemed like GWT would be like they like it is maintained, right? Google does maintain it. They just don't support it like an enterprise company would. So they by far have the most expertise in, in compilers compared to other people. Like, I think they have like some J suite project or something like that, but um, it seemed like they didn't, they, like they had something that worked, but didn't seem like they had the expertise to see if it, like to make it really work, right? right. Have, you, uh, have you checked out uh, 
Jackal or J2CL. It's like the next generation group compiler. It's also uh, made by Google. Yeah, I, I looked at it a bit. Um, it seems like they, uh, it's still too hooked into the, their, the Google ecosystem. Yeah. So like it's, yeah, like it's like you need to actually, yeah, I, it, 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 so it's based on Google, uh, Google's closure framework for JavaScript. Yeah. And I don't like Google's closure framework. So it's one of these like, I, yeah, like at some point someone will rewrite it. So it's not dependent on Google's closure stuff, but uh, yeah, I don't like Google's closure stuff, so I didn't want to dive into it to figure out how to get it working yet. So I'm, I'm waiting until Red Hat gets around to, to fixing it. So. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you very much.